How many of you have moved more than twice in your life? <coughs> Three? Four? Well, we got a lot of service members here. I'm afraid to ask. What's yeah. the number you got? <laughs> yeah. Gene, take off your shoes so I can use your toes too, right? You got 10? Wow. 15? 20? Oh my goodness. Holy cow. All right. So I mean, you move more than once, all right? Uh, let me just do it this way. How many of you can remember like all your addresses? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe one or two, right? All right. Now, here's just a thought for you. How amazing and unbelievable would it be if we discovered a time capsule in your backyard today? We went out back and we dug it up. And in that time capsule, it had your name, your age, and it had a description of you that was undoubtedly you. And it said, well, let's just say it's Becky. It said, welcome, Becky. We're glad you finally got here. We've been waiting on you to open this up this very day. And you discovered it was from 400 years ago. How unbelievable will that be? Would you believe it? No, you're not buying it. How many of you are going to buy it? <laughs> Nobody? Are you kidding me? Come on. Nobody's buying it. You would buy it? Yeah, he's like, I'd buy it, sure, sure, whatever. We, we can sell him all kinds of stuff, guys, later, so let's get on. Right. Now, here's just a thought for you. That would be unimaginably believable. You and I would, would do this. We would go, there's got to be a trick, right? There's something going on that's not right. There's got to be a trick. Are we up? All right, there we go. And so here's what I want you to think about. Here's what's absolutely impressive. What we're talking about today is out of the book of Isaiah 53, we're going to talk about how Isaiah wrote the exact address and description of Jesus from 400 years before Jesus, so much so that it is unimaginable and even unbelievable. And here's the, the if I had one phrase that you tweet, that you put on Facebook, I want you to get this. You ready? You can take a picture of it. A loving God who suffers and dies to save you. A loving God who suffers and dies to save you, knows everything you're going to do, can be trusted to guide you through. Let me say that again. A loving God who suffers and dies to save you, knows everything you're going to do, can be trusted to guide you through. And here's just a thought for you. Ready? If we really trust Isaiah 53, and we're going to crawl into it in just a moment, here's what we got to wrestle with. Is that 400 years before Jesus, Isaiah described the suffering that Jesus would endure for you and I upon the cross and the suffering before the cross. 400 years before Jesus, Isaiah said, this is what's going to happen and this is why it's going to happen. And then Jesus came and did that anyways, knowing full well the suffering that would take place. Because that's the only way to what? To prophesy the future, right? That's the only way is to say, well, he actually knew what was going to go on, right? And anybody who what? Loves you enough to suffer and die for you. Who already knows what you're going to do, right? Because God's outside of time, right? And we know that from, from creation. If God created, he can't be in time to create time, right? He has to be outside of time or else he couldn't have created time. And so a God who loves you enough to suffer and die for you, knows everything you're going to do, can be trusted what? What? Your future can be trusted to guide you through. Now, this is a huge cover. This is a huge cover. If you're at the doctor and you hear the news, hey, you've been diagnosed with dot, dot, dot. Got a call just this week. A friend of mine, not part of our community, from out of state, said, I've just been diagnosed with dot, dot, dot. And I said to them this very phrase. He said, hey, let me just, I'm not trying to give you quick help. I'm just trying to remind you of eternal truths. And he said, I'm working on this with the sermon. And I said, just let me remind you that a God who loves you enough he suffers and dies for you. He knew everything that you were going to do. He can be trusted to guide you through your future. Whatever it is. Because this cancer, it didn't shock him. Right? God isn't on the throne and suddenly, whoa, I didn't see that coming. Right? God's like, I, 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 it's okay. Put your trust in God. Because if he loves you that much, guess what? He is going to care for you. That doesn't mean it's going to be easy. Pulling out from Michael's book club, right? The Max Lucado, you will get through this. It may not be easy. It may not be quick. It may not be painless, right? But God is still good all the way through, right? Hey, your marriage is under fritz. Maybe you're struggling with some really bad depression. Trouble with your parents or some of you have trouble with your kids or grandkids, right? Let me just say to you, give it to God in prayer. Why? Because a God who loves you enough to suffer and die for you knows everything that not only you are going to do, but they are going to do, can be trusted to guide you through, right? 
Trouble on your job? Maybe you got released from a job? Hey, let me just remind you. That didn't shock God. God isn't like, what? You got fired. Oh my gosh, you got released. They're doing cutbacks. I didn't, I didn't see that coming. I am so sorry. I should have. I said, Gabe, 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 Gabe. Yeah, come down here. You angels are supposed to be in charge of reminding. That's it. That conversation never happens in heaven, does it? Right? A God who what? Loves you enough to suffer and die for you. Knows everything you're going to do. Can be trusted to guide you through. It won't be quick. It won't be painless. It won't be easy. But he is a good God who will guide you through. Real quick, this is important. Uh, there's a difference between prediction and prophecy. You, you follow me? Prediction? Predictions like this year, I'm predicting that the Reds will not win the World Series. Okay? I really would love them to, but I'm predicting based on the evidence that I've seen so far, it doesn't look good for us. Okay, I don't know who's going to win, so I'm not very good at predicting, all right? But I'm just saying that, that it doesn't look like we're going to get there. I'm predicting that. And that is a thought or a belief based on evidence from the past that you cast forward and go, I'm predicting this will or will not happen. Another way that I can predict is say this, something like this. I predict that tomorrow when I go to wake up my kids, they'll have trouble getting out of bed. Why is that? Because they've always had trouble getting out. I mean, I'm like kicking them this morning. Like, let's go, right? So a prediction is something out of the past that you go, I believe this because of the past. A prophecy, on the other hand, is something totally different. A prophecy is a future that's waiting to happen, if it's a true prophecy. It's believed because of a proclamation from the past. So if someone stands up, Joe stands up right now and says, I have a prophetic announcement to make. All right, now, this is different now. If Joe's not a prophet, then we'll find out it's not true, and Joe, therefore, is not a prophet. But a prophet actually makes what? He makes a proclamation about the future that we're waiting to get to. That we're waiting to get to. So when we read Isaiah 53, there's a big difference. He's not predicting the future. He's not saying, hey, based on the past, this is what I think is going to happen. He's actually saying this has already happened. God let me in on it because God's outside of time. And I just want to tell you what is coming. I want to tell you what is coming. Ready? A couple fun facts just so that we have these in our head before we get there. There are over 300, 300 prophecies about Jesus written in the Old Testament. That's pretty amazing. Over 300 prophecies written about Jesus in the Old Testament, written over a period of a thousand years. Okay? So from the very beginning of Genesis, from the very beginning of Genesis, right, we see that, hey, the snake will bite on the ankle and, and the, 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 the Son of Man will crush the snake's head. And we already have hints that, hey, already in Genesis, at the beginning with the fall, there's something about Jesus that's coming. There's something about Jesus that's coming, right? And by the way, Using science, I think this is very fascinating. I'm not a numbers guy, as many of you know, uh, but here's just an interesting fact. Using the science of probability, we find the chances of just 48 of these prophecies being fulfilled by one person to be one, and that number is huge, isn't it? 10,000, all right, 157. That's huge. That's huge. And so I couldn't get my head around this, and I'm going to give you a visual image that I still can't get my head around. The visual image is, imagine someone took quarters and spread them out all over the state of Rhode Island. The state of Rhode Island. The state. Not, not part of it, but the state. And it said to you, go find this one quarter and do it blindfolded. That would be the probability of this number actually coming to take place. That's a big deal. And so when we read the prophecies in the Bible, again, what they're doing is they're predicting Jesus' address, if you will who he's going to be, what he's going to do. And it should be like, when we read this, we should go, this is amazing. Our God must know the future. Our God, who loves us and cares for us enough all right, to die for us, knows what we're going to do. He must be someone that we can trust to guide us through our current circumstances. In fact, here's the argument against Isaiah 53 and the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah is predicting Jesus so well and does such an amazing job, so specific, that people go, you know what? The book of Isaiah had to be written or at least edited after Jesus. It's just impossible for someone to do it this well. Because why? You're not buying it, right? The idea that someone can predict your address, bury a time capsule in your backyard, and say, hey, welcome, Becky. Good to see you and predict who you are going to be. 
Now, you would go, someone put this here just last week. They, I mean, this is a joke, right? The same thought is happened with the book of Isaiah, but here's the problem, all right? In the Dead Sea Scrolls, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, we found the entire book of Isaiah, all right, written, all right, the entire book of Isaiah, and it has been dated to between 150 to 200 B.C. Now, that's when this copy, let me be clear, that's when that copy was written. Isaiah lived 400 years before Jesus. So the prophecies made 400 years before Jesus, but if someone wants to go, well, it's too specific. It had to be written before, the, after, the, after Jesus. It's the only way we can get these details correct. You'd have to say, sorry, we have an actual scroll from 200 years before Jesus giving us the exact detail. The evidence is absolutely rock solid. Let me introduce you uh, to a passage that Jesus uses when he quotes Isaiah. It's out of Luke 22. He says this, For I tell you this, that Scripture must be fulfilled in me. This is what he says. And he was numbered with the transgressors. And he was numbered with the transgressors. Jesus is quoting the book of Isaiah to explain and tell people who he is. Jesus is quoting the book of Isaiah to explain and tell people who he is. So he says, hey, when you're looking for the address and job description and identity for the Messiah, you have now found it in who? In me. In me. Let me introduce you to Dr. Barry Leventhal. Anybody know who this is? Any big football fans? Dr. Barry Leventhal, before he was Dr. Barry Leventhal, was part of the, he was the offensive captain of the UCLA 1966 championship football team. Yeah, any UCLA fans? Someone at home was cheering, I think, maybe, online, right? All right, now let me tell you about a story about this guy. Uh, Dr. Barry Leventhal, uh, before he was that, when he was just a football guy uh, playing for UCLA, uh, was a Jew. Grew up in a Jewish household, did all the typical Jewish things that you would do, attended all the festivals and celebrations, attended worship on a regular basis. And he's got a fascinating story. And I'm going to give you the very, 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 very small story here just to help you understand what's going on. But in the midst of him being on campus, one of his friends who was a Christian kept trying to talk to him about Jesus. And it got to the point where while they were good friends, he finally said, you have a trick Bible. And his friend goes, what are you talking about? He goes, you keep talking about all these passages from my Old Testament and talk about Jesus. You have a trick Bible. And the, the friend finally said, L listen, Larry, just go, go get your Tanakh at home. Go, that's the Jewish Bible. He said, go get it and read it for yourself. You'll see I'm not operating with a trick Bible. There's nothing I've added here. He says, go get your Jewish Bible and read it and you'll discover I don't have a trick Bible. So he Barry went home and he read his Jewish Bible, he said, I had to find it in my closet. I got it out. I'm reading it. And he goes, I'm going, oh my gosh, these passages are real. And he's reading Isaiah 53 because that's the one that his friend challenged him to read. Where he says, so I went to my rabbi. And I said to my rabbi, hey, can you explain Isaiah 53? Who is it talking about? And this is what his rabbi said. He said, Barry, I must admit that as I read Isaiah 53, it does seem like it's talking about Jesus. He says, but since we Jews don't believe in Jesus, it can't be speaking about Jesus. Uh, right? And this is what Jerry, excuse me, Barry says. He said, at that time, I didn't know a lot about formal logic. I was a, a college football player. But I knew enough to say that something was circular here, and it didn't sound quite right. He said it was April, three months after the glorious Rose Bowl celebration championship win. Then he says, I realized I had nothing that withstood the test of time, yet alone the test of eternity. Long story short, Barry began to read more and more of the Old Testament prophecies about Jesus and began to say that he can only be describing one person. Barry says, I gave my life to Jesus based on the evidence that led me to an emotional relationship with Jesus. Barry currently serves as the academic professor of Southern Evangelical Seminary near Charlotte, North Carolina, and works as a Jew for Jesus, converting Jews to Jesus using the Old Testament scriptures that give you the exact address of Jesus. Let's face it like this. Remember, a loving God, a God who loves you enough to suffer and die to save you, 
knows what you're going to do. Can guide you through. Let's take a look at Isaiah. Ready? Isaiah 52. When you talk about Isaiah 53, it's called the suffering servant passage. You actually have to step back in 52 and grab the tail end of 52 to get the, the passage right. The guy who wrote the numbers into the Bible, remember, Isaiah didn't write numbers. The guy who wrote the numbers in didn't quite have the beginning correct. All right, so you go back in Isaiah 52 to see one. We're just going to pull out a few of these. Ready? He says, see my servant whack wisely. He will be raised up and lifted, highly exalted. Now we have two moments when Jesus is raised up. All right? We have the cross moment. We also have the ascension moment when he's taken to heaven, right? All right? And so when we look at the prophecies, we're going, hey, my servant will be raised up and highly exalted. And we have what? What do we do every Sunday then? We lift up the name of Jesus. Now, again, if you just had one of these, you could go, well, maybe we're talking about somebody else. You got to put together the whole work and go, wow. This became very difficult to say it was anybody else but Jesus, and we're not covering them all, though, okay? So your homework is go back and read Isaiah 52 and 53, and you see all the ways that this pinpoints Jesus Christ. Isaiah 52, 14 says, Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured that of men, excuse me, so disfigured beyond that of any man, and his formal marred beyond human likeness. Now, this is describing the suffering servant, the Messiah to come for Israel. All right? And so for Israel, they're going, why is he disformed? Why is he disfigured? Why would anybody do this to the Messiah? How could the Messiah be disfigured? How could his form be marred beyond that of human likeness? Well, if you study at all, all right, the concept and the practice of the Roman whipping, it is an absolutely horrible event that many people died from just that. They didn't even make it to the cross. In fact, I have two pages of what it's like to be whipped and abused by the Romans here as the end of the whip would have pieces of rock and shards of metal on it and how it would tear right through the skin. Now remember, after this is done, they didn't rush you down to the hospital, right? They didn't do the x-rays. They didn't do the, uh, the CAT scans and find everything that was wrong and put you back together and you had a good chance of survival. Most people who were whipped by the Romans died. Most people who were ripped, whipped by the Romans died. And, and if you're looking for good reading, and again, I'm just taking this from Dr. Uh, Marathal, uh, one of the best books that you can track this down in case you're going, hey, I want to know more about this. Get the Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. He spends, he spends an entire uh, chapter basically just describing the torture that Jesus went through. All right? And here's what I would say to you. Is remember that the very word excruciating means to come out of the cross. Where we got our word, we say, oh my gosh, that's excruciating. That very word was from the Roman concept of coming off or out of the cross. Isaiah 53, 3 says, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering, like one from whom men hid their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Luke 9, verse 22, Jesus says, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and teachers of the law. He must be killed and on the third day be raised again. Now, let me just point to you that those who were in Israel pre-Jesus and those who are still looking for the Messiah read this and they have to do mental gymnastics to get past that it's Jesus. Those of us who read this out of Isaiah go, Oh, that sounds like somebody I know. Now, we're not just saying, well, Jesus goes back and fits in here. We're saying all this aligns up with who Jesus was and what he did. Now, why is that important? Because this is written when? 400 years before Jesus. So when Paul says, hey, my next crisis in life happened, guess what? He's talking to a God who isn't shocked by it and goes, I got you. I love you. I'm taking care of you. I have already prepared a place for you here and will guide you through what you're going through right now. Let me give you one or two more. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. Remember, we get to the passage out of Deuteronomy where it talks about it as a curse for anyone to be hung on a tree. It is a curse for anyone to be hung on a tree. On the Old Testament, all right? Anyone who is hung on a pole is under God's curse. So we consider him stricken by God, smitten by him. We go, he, God didn't even like him. All the prophecies come together to describe one person. Now, again, there's just pause. There's no other religion in the world. No other religion in the world that has anything like this. No other religion in the world. 
Has anything like this? So if you're wanting just one passage to say, hey, I'm going to prove to you from evidence that this is talking about Jesus and there is no other God, Isaiah 53 should be your passage to jump to. Isaiah 53. So when we think of something unbelievable, that's what we're dealing with. One more. Isaiah 53, 5 says, But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. Wow. A loving God who suffers and dies to save you knows everything you're going to do and be trusted to guide you through. Let me give you one quick story here. When I was in college, uh, I was a basketball player, and I say that because that was my identity. As a college student, I was a basketball player. My junior year, I blew out my knee. I don't know if you've ever been wrapped up into something, and that was your identity, and then had it taken away. Those of you that have been through a divorce, you know what that's like. Those of you that were in charge of a company, or you said, hey, I am whatever, and that's the worker, and suddenly you lost your job again. You know what that's like. And here's what happened. When I blew out my knee, I went to the doctor, and the doctor said, you can keep playing ball, which you absolutely love, or when you're 30, you will not be able to walk and you will not be able to play with your kids. That's a pretty, pretty, pretty big decision for someone who's 19, 20 to make, right? And I sat down and I thought, of all the times that I love playing ball with my dad and all the connections and intimacy that we had as a family, how much I wanted my kids. Oh, by the way, I didn't have kids at the time. Didn't even have a girlfriend at the time. But I knew that one day my goal was to do this with my kids. Therefore, I made the decision to give that up. So that my body wouldn't be destroyed so that I could do that with my family. The irony is that none of my kids love playing basketball. <laughs> But I had to make a decision in my past to say this is what my future will be. I just want to bring this to your mind. That God made a decision in the past to protect, to preserve, and to rescue your future. 400 years before it happened, he wrote it down through the prophet Isaiah and said, I just want you to see what's coming. And then I don't want you to live in fear. I don't want you to live with regret. I don't want you to live in shame. I want you to live in wholeness and remembering this, remembering that I have suffered and died to save you. I knew what you were going to do. You can trust me with your future to guide you through. That is unbelievable love. And I hope today that if you're going, I'm worried about tomorrow. This COVID thing's got me scared. We've got rioting. We've got all kinds of craziness going on. I just The future gives me anxiety. I just, let, me, let me just invite you to rest with this prayer. The God who loves you enough to suffer and die to save you. Knew what you were going to do. You can be trusted to guide you through. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, you don't create bad things. You work in spite of them and because of them. You promise that you will work good in all things for those who trust you. And so God, we proclaim this truth this morning that God, you who suffered and died to save us, you knew what we were going to go through and what we were going to do. And so we're going to put our trust in you every day to say you knew the past, you knew the present, you knew the future before it happened. And so, God, we throw everything that we have in on you and declare that this is an unbelievable thing unless you are true. Because you are true, Father, we trust you. In Jesus' name we pray.